chapter. Uh, let's go to the ninth verse. And I'm going to start at the D clause, just the fourth clause in. Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth wherein all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air and there came a voice to him rise Peter kill and eat but Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, call not thou common. Let's go down to the 28th verse. And he said unto them, ye know how that it is unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company. Or come into one of or of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I asked therefore, what intent have you sent for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Wake up. Come out of your comfort zone. You are an answer to someone's prayer. You are in answer to someone's prayer. You may take your seats. The Lord has blessed the word. As I was seeking what to preach about, I always seek the Lord and ask him, what would you have me to say to your people? And I had something else in mind dealing with the power of the Holy Ghost that we have been talking about in Bible study. We're talking about the purpose and place of the anointing. We've been speaking about the anointing. And, and the purpose of the anointing and the power of God. Many people are trying to do things outside of the power of God. God blesses you with the Holy Ghost to be able to do certain things. And when you do not have the Holy Ghost, it's not preached a whole lot in certain circles. But those of us of the apostolic persuasion and those of us who are Pentecostal know that the power of the Holy Ghost is needed. You have to have the Holy Ghost. Many people are baptized and they feel, I'm good, I'm covered. No, 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 you're not. That's a good start. But he said, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. This was in the second chapter. Now we see in the 10th chapter, we see that Peter, the same spokesman, is on the top of the roof. He had never experienced that type of encounter with God so he didn't understand how God would change his plans to include other people, particularly the Gentiles. Now remember, God doesn't change. But because we get something later, we think, oh, God changed his mind. No, no, no. It was already in his eye view. It was already in his plan to include other people. But when you've been racist a long time, don't have me go there. You think it's nobody but you. When we look at prejudice, pride, and, and, and racism in our country, we confuse that with what the will of God is because it's happening for so long. I'm not preaching an Afrocentric message today, per se. I'm preaching the fact that many times we have left people out where God has included them. Come on, somebody. Talking about the Jesus that died for everybody. I'm not talking about the doctrine of inclusion. No, no, no. That's something totally separate. I'm saying that when he died on a tree, he included everybody in his mind. So nobody was secluded from that vision that God had for us. However, people don't like change. We don't like change. We like to be predictable. We like to think that God just includes certain people. We 
quote the scripture, well, the Lord said, I'm God and I change not. He doesn't change his character, but he will allow history to include people that other people have left out. You don't believe in racism that exists, go to the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. We know how they didn't like Zipporah. They didn't like Moses' wife. She's a Cushite. What's she doing? She black. Why met Moses marrying that Cushite woman? And, and, and people have, scholars have said, well, it wasn't just because of her skin. It was because of what she worshipped. I understand all that. But we understand that racism is alive and well. And we have to make sure that it's not rooted and grounded in this here church. We have to make sure that it's not rooted and grounded and, 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 and moving us by that thing. I don't mean to sound particularly political today, but I'm, 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 I'm grieved that even the church world will set out people and say, you can see God, but you can't see God. And God will never use you, but he will use me. God will never use you to prophesy, but he's going to use me. Who are you to exclude what God has included? So here we are now. 2019 where uh, certain laws had to be made because they exclude us. Let's just be real. The Constitution was never written with us in mind. At that time, the earth was ruled by British rule. and then they, didn't, they didn't even include us in the Constitution. Who is three-fifths of a man? So we have to look beyond what man has said. And what did God say about your situation? What did God say about your salvation? I'm so glad he included me. Here we are. Now laws have to include us. And people don't quite know how to take that. This is what happened to Peter as the Lord directed him to witness to Cornelius, who was a Gentile. He was a, uh, he had, he was a centurion. He had many men under him, under the Italian army. Cornelius sought God. He didn't know what he was seeking, but he knew he wanted more. People don't like change, though. I remember reading a story about Henry Ford. He developed a Model T car. And he was the first in many lot of succession to uh, 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 orchestrate such a vehicle. The Bible and, and, and many people have said that he was so he was such a stickler for precision that even one of his main engineers by the name of William Knudsen came to him and said, "Mr. Ford, I found a better way uh, to be the car more efficient." He said, no, I built this Model T away and I'm not changing because that's the way I said I'm going to do it. He said, but Mr. Ford, I have a more efficient way of building a car. He says, I won't hear of it. Well, the story goes, he went to Europe on his vacation. When he came back, Mr. Nutson had had a prototype of the car, painted it red, beautiful. Mr. Ford got so upset. They say he took a hammer and got so mad and just trashed the car, hit the hinges, hit the window. He says, I said, I don't want anything other than what I created. So he went over, Mr. Nutson went over to General Motors and built a better car. After Ford sales start going down, then Mr. Ford scratches his head and said, well, because of my competition, I guess I'll have to change. Many times we're stuck and we feel that it's this way or no way. Mind you, I'm not talking about the apostolic doctrine. I'm talking about our way of thinking. My husband talking about thinking big. You have to see what am I going to be responsible for after God blesses me. It's not just about the blessing, it's about the responsibility. Because once you have come into a revelation knowledge, now you have a responsibility. And you respond with the ability to do it. So we have to be careful. When God says, that person is blessed. They can look cursed all day long. They can look raggedy. Oh, Lord. But God sees something in them you don't have the spiritual eyesight to see. 
Sometimes we can look at our children and they're, oh, well, they, they're always in trouble, always suspended, always, always in trouble. You have to see what other people don't see and say, that child has greatness. Yes, he runs his mouth. Maybe he's going to be a senator one day. Maybe he's going to be a lawyer one day. Yes, she's always in trouble. She's always got the kids in the huddle. Maybe she's going to be a, a, a president one day. Maybe she's going to be a leader. So you have to look and see what other people don't see. I'm coming to my point. Just give me a few minutes. And so we realize, we look at this uh, chapter 10 of Acts. Now remember, just a few chapters ago, this is Peter saying, this is that. That was spoken by the prophet Joel. He went on to prophesy about all these nations. But yet when he gets to Cornelius' house, all of a sudden he said, not so, Lord. It shows you how you can be in the will of God one day and the next day be out of your mind. The Bible says that Cornelius was seeking God for change. He was seeking, Lord, I know there's a better way. He was seeking God in his house. Somebody said, nobody likes change but a, a wet baby. And even the wet baby is irritating while you're changing. But after you get through changing that baby, it thanks you by smiling and Googling. So we don't like change. But when God shifts us out of our current paradigm and moves us somewhere else, we're fighting change all the time. But once we see the blessings over here, then we say, Lord, thank you. But it took us to go from here to here to understand the blessings and changes of God. Look, changes of God. The Bible says that Cornelius was seeking God to bless him. So in our scripture today, it's hard for us to imagine how something so dramatic and so changes uh, compared to where we are now. We don't recognize how different our world is from that world. It's really very similar because people don't change. They just be born, they die, and they move on. But the mentality of people has to shift for God to change. We have to change how we look at things. And he was all in my message and didn't even know it. We have to look and see, Lord, help me to see this situation like you see it because when we come to a situation we bring our own preconceived notions and we bring our limited background and look at what God has for us so the theme coming up for harvest time we look at the scripture the fields are white pray that the Lord will send laborers not souls but laborers he said all souls are mine but I need some laborers. So you have to have the spiritual eyesight to be able to see what's not there. So I'm looking at you all. I'm seeing some empty pews. You see the empty pews, but I see souls in every corner of this place. I'm looking through faith in 3D. I'm looking at what cannot be seen. I'm looking at people coming in who are offering their talents. I'm looking at people who are coming who want to be saved. I'm looking at the drug dealer. I'm looking at the prostitute. I'm looking at people that you can't see. Why? Because he said, all oh, souls are mine. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Peter was invited to be a part of this phenomenon that would change that village. It was a big deal. It was such a big deal that the first half of that chapter, God was trying to get Peter ready. You look at that, he goes on and talks to Peter. He talks to people. And many times, it's not like the opportunity is not there. God has to prepare you for what he's getting ready to download into you. It's not like the opportunity's not there. He's trying to prepare you and get your stubbornness out to see. Look, it's more than us for and no more. But God has to prepare your heart to receive them. God's had to prepare your mind to understand what's getting ready to happen. God's got to prepare your intellect because some of us think too much. We're too analytical. If it doesn't make sense, we won't do it. If it doesn't line up, we won't do it. How many know that God's word doesn't have to line up to your word? His will does not have to line up to your will. It's not what I want or it's my life. No, it's not. If you name the name of the Lord. You belong to God. You are a child of the King. It's not your world. It's not your life. It's not your money. Everything belongs to God. And when you understand that you don't mean that much, but you mean a lot. 
you'll understand some things. He works with us. He works through us. And he works because of us. But we have to be willing vessels to negate all the things that we want to learn about certain people. Peter told the Lord, now Lord, you know I haven't touched nothing unclean. Now remember eight chapters ago, he cussed some people out. But Lord, I don't touch nothing unclean. You see how you gagging a that and swallow a camel? But Peter, you just got through cussing saying, I never knew him. You lying, blank to blank. All of a sudden, he's pious in the 10th chapter. Oh, Lord, I've never touched anything that wasn't kosher. Y'all laughing because you know you can see you in that. The Bible says Jesus said, God had to come to him three times. Lord, if this you bid me come. Same Peter on the water. I could talk about Peter a while because I think all of us can relate to him. We may not be impetuous as Peter. We may be slow to see, but we have the same willful, stubborn attitude. The Lord had to show him three times. Look, Peter, I said I'm God, and what I said is clean. Don't call unclean. But, Lord, I'm a Jew of Jews. You know I'm the one that spoke on the day of Pentecost. I preached and 3,000 people were saved that day. I'm the one told men and brethren what you... He said, I'm the one rose up and said... See, here is water. What doth hinder thee to be baptized? Uh, so, so Peter's like, Lord, not me. Now, he went to him three times. How many times has God has had to talk to you? The Lord had to sell him. Look, dude, I told you it's me. <laughs> Mother Scott. <laughs> and so many times we have the need to give God our spiritual resume. Lord, I pay tithes. Lord, I give an offering. Lord, I do this. But he sees your heart. Finally, it occurred to Peter, let me get with the program. Let me get with the program because I know it's God. Though I've never seen a sheet let out like this with all the unclean animals, and we don't have time to go into the typology of what the animals mean, but we know that it was something that he didn't eat. That's what you need to know. He said, Lord, I will obey. By that time, uh, Cornelius was praying. I'm telling you, when I read this text, it set my soul on fire. Because how many times have you prayed for something and didn't tell nobody? But God allowed that person to come and bless you. You didn't tell nobody you were sick. Somebody get on the phone and say, I'm praying for your body right now. You don't know what God has in store for you. God has your mind in somebody else's mouth. He has your name in their mouth. I know what I'm talking about. Many times I've been in prayer. Someone has called or texted me and said, I don't know what's going on in your family. I don't know what's going on in your church, but I'm praying for you. Don't you know we serve an omniscient God? We serve an omnipresent God. He's not just the God of Jews. He's the God of the Samaritans. He's the God of the Gentile. He's the God of the Baptist. He's the God of the Church of God in Christ. He's the God of every nation. Bless his name. And for us to grow, in 2020, I'm going to give you my vision in just a couple of weeks as we go toward this intentional vision for 2020. We have to understand we can't be the Peters that we see in the Bible with his temperament, that is. Peter was a strong man. He had strong convictions. But when God shows you somebody, as they come through the church, don't judge them. Don't look at them like they're trash. Don't look at them like they don't want to be saved. They drunk. They stumble up in here. They got some kind of sense. I've seen people go down in Jesus' name drunk. Come up speaking in other tongues. I've seen prostitutes come down this road. They didn't want a God. They didn't know how they were going to get it. But they know they wanted God. And we have to be in a position to receive them. There's going to be some more Corneliuses here coming. They want to be saved. Don't judge them. Pray for them. Hallelujah. Peter said, no, Lord. Can't do it. This happened three times when the blanket was pulled back up into the sky. 
Peter sat there trying to figure out what it all meant. By this time, Cornelius' people came up to the door. Peter was such in a trance. He didn't even hear the door. The Holy Ghost. Hear the Holy Ghost again. Peter, go answer the door. They're at the door. He was so involved in what he saw. He couldn't address what he was supposed to do. Sometimes we get so enthralled in what we see, it paralyzes us. Don't get paralyzed by the pain. Don't get paralyzed by the vision. Don't get paralyzed by the trance. Look up and see God because help is on the way. Don't get paralyzed with what you're going through. The sheet is being pulled back up in the heavens. The sheet is being pulled down. He said what I call clean, don't call unclean. But we have our apostolic Pentecostal prejudice. We have to learn to reach the masses at any cost. We have to get them in here in Jesus' name. We have to baptize. No, we're not taken down from the standard. But honey, we cannot call people unclean whom God has called clean. Now remember, God is speaking in eternity future. Many times we look at people in eternity past. We're not looking at the Kairos moment of the time. Now he said the sons of Issachar... They discern the times and the seasons. So we have to pray, God, make me a son of Issachar, that I can discern when the shift is again ready to happen. We've got to be able to say, we're not going to take down for the name of Jesus, but this is a more excellent way. Don't tell them they don't have nothing, because they come in here with the Holy Ghost. They come in here speaking in tongues. We can't tell them you don't have nothing. We say, you need to be baptized. you got a, a more excellent way. So he that went to souls is wise. Peter was not wise. Even in his conviction, he was not wise. He had to come out of his comfort zone. Now look at those tennis shoes. Those tennis shoes is what's comfortable for most of us when we walk. When you walk in the spirit, you got to take off your shoes. For the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. It's not just your shoes, it's your preconceived notions. When Moses approached the bush, he had to come out of his comfort zone. It wasn't about him just taking off his his, his sandals because they were a piece of leather. He said, Moses, step out of your tradition. Step out of what you knew me before. I'm Jehovah God. I can do anything. Don't relegate me to just a group of people. So Peter had that same issue. The Bible says that the Lord had to arrest Peter's mind and spirit. And the Spirit of God spoke to him and saying, Peter, there are three men knocking at the door looking for you. Go down there and go with them. Don't ask any questions. I sent them to you. The Bible says that Peter went down and said to the men, I I think I'm the man you're looking for. What do you need? They say, Captain Cornelius is a God-fearing man. He's known to give alms. And if you ask anybody in that part of the country, uh, he, he was commanded by a holy angel to get you and bring you to his house so he could hear what you had to say. The Bible says that uh, Peter had some, um, what can I say? He had some convincing. He had to do some convince. Lord, if this is you, let me know. And when the men came, it was a confirmation. Sometimes God will take you not only out of your comfort zone, but he has to confirm what was already his word, but he has to bring you to the place where you now can receive it. He has to bring you. Now, he's been, he's God all along, but he's got to bring us to the place where we say, yes, Lord. He's got to bring us to the place of surrender. He's got to bring us to the place where we say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. I've done it my way long enough, Lord. You see, it hasn't worked for you, have it? Well, this is what I'm going to do. So the Bible, so the Lord has to oftentimes take us from different situations To prove who he is. So he's got to wake us up. He's got to cause situations to come into our life and we become awake. Because we think we're awake until something happens and then you show enough pray. You're not awake until you start praying. 
Why? Because prayer heightens your senses of spirituality. Prayer will open your mind up. Prayer will open your life up. Because while you're praying, God is showing you some things. While you're praying, God is making a way out of no way. While you're praying, God is revealing himself to you in a way you've never experienced before. I don't care how long you've been saved. Sometimes people talk about how long they've been saved. But they're spiritual midgets. Be careful. Don't talk about how long you've been saved when your fruit is not equal to the years. Because when you say, I've been saved all that long, but you're immature in certain areas, now you're throwing people off. You mean you've been saved for 40 years and you're still cussing people out? you still giving people a piece of your mind? So something about us has to have changed in 40 years. Something has changed. And we see Peter goes from the second chapter of Acts to the 10th chapter of Acts. And yes, he might have been more pious, but he was still racist. He was still prejudiced. But Lord, you said I'm not supposed to eat these things. Now it's okay. So when God speaks to you, I'm telling you, it takes some time. Because we have been taught certain things. We've been taught prejudice against certain people. You know, we were told, you, you, you heard my father give the example when he was in the army. Um, some of the people looked to him when he was in the uh, um, changing room and they, looked, they kept looking behind him while he was in the dressing room. He said, why y'all keep looking at me? What's wrong with you? We're looking to see if you have a tail. Because we were told black people had tails. I'm telling you. You've heard him say that. So what I'm saying is, did he have a tail? No. But because of their preconceived notions, they, had, they thought he had one based upon what they heard. But honey, you got to know God for yourself. I can tell you he's a healer, but when I've really been healed, then I can really tell you he's a healer. I can tell you he make a way out of no way because I know his ability. But when he has really made a way out of no way, I can tell that with conviction. I'm not just talking. I'm talking from experience. Hallelujah. The Bible says he finally relented and went with them. The part that blessed me is so that when he gets to Cornelius' house, Cornelius goes on to tell him, I prayed that this would happen, but I didn't know how it was going to happen. Listen, when you put your request before God, you don't know who God is going to bless you through. You don't know who God is going to work a miracle through. Don't turn your nose up at people because you don't like them. Your blessing, you think your cursing is really your blessing. Cornelius, the Bible says, Cornelius was a devout man of the Italian army. He was a devout man. But when I look at the fact that Peter was such in a comfort zone, he didn't know that he was going to be the answer to someone's prayer. How many times has God used you to be an answer to someone's prayer? I don't have time to go into the etymology of the word and what all that means. When you look at the entire 10th chapter of Acts, it goes on to show you just how blessed the people were. It goes on to show you how Cornelius' house was saved because a prejudiced man was convicted himself and God had to change his mind. Yes, he was a man of God. Yes, he spoke on the day of Pentecost, but he still had some issues. Even though you're saved, you still may have some issues. But when I look at the layers of this chapter, I look at the layers, Bishop, of how Peter was all that and he was so hungry. But he was not hungry for the word, he was hungry for food. Because when the word shows up, he says, not so, Lord. So then you have to check yourself, Lord, am I hungry for your word or am I hungry for your will as well? Because we love to read the word, but when the will starts to unfold, we start saying, Lord, I can't see myself doing that. Lord, I don't know. Is it you? I don't know. I'm this. I don't have this. I don't have that. He said, you didn't have it anyway. But I have to put my spirit in you so you can be truly anointed. Peter gets to Cornelius' house. He says, I'm here. 
I'm straight now. I'm good because God dealt with me. When God deals with you, you'll be able to walk in the will and the way of God. When God truly deals with you, you'll understand what he's saying. When God truly deals with you, you'll be able to be led by God. When God really deals with you, you'll put aside your opinions and say, what did God say? We are an answer to someone else's prayer. Sometimes we don't think about it. We say, what can I offer? I don't have this. I was talking to an individual not too long ago, and they were going on, 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 what they didn't have. And I said, it's not about you anyway. It's about the power of God. Look, I don't care how many uh, uh, initials you have behind your name. It doesn't mean you're anointed. It just means you're prepared for this earthly realm. But God can take that and anoint you for a greater service. So we have to be careful that we look at what we don't have instead of looking at who God is. I may not have this, but I have the power of God. I may not have 50 initials behind my name, but I know the voice of God. Do you know the voice of the God when you are looking at something that's antithetical to your thinking? Do you know the voice of God when it looks like, no, this must be the... Now, some of us would have said, no, this is the devil. He showed me all these, and we, we know we can't eat. But he said, Peter, this is me talking. He had to come to him, the Bible says, thrice. He had to come to him three times. Look, I know what you've been taught, but you stood on the day of Pentecost and, 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 and preached to all different types of people. So, Bishop, I thought as I read the text, I said, if you preach to all those different people on the day of Pentecost... What makes you think you couldn't talk to Cornelius? You know, because I think like that. But it's not until God has to show us himself who he is. When our eyes become open. As long as I tell at a price something, it go over one ear. But when God tells him something, it'll stick. He can tell me something and I'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, somebody. We can talk to our loved ones about things, but until God shows them himself, they have to go through for themselves. They have to understand God is a reality for myself. You have to go through your own situations. I don't care what people say. You have to have your own encounter with God. Your own encounter with God will garner you a testimony that you no one can take from you. When you've walked with God and you've learned from God, then the Bible says the household was saved. Then Cornelius says, I prayed for you. I was home praying for you. Suddenly there was an angel, he says, in front of me. He says, Cornelius, your daily prayers and acts have brought you to God's attention. Honey, it's not your acumen, it's not your pedigree that gets God's attention. It's not who you are that gets God's attention. He said, your prayers have got God's attention. And our prayers come before God as a sweet-smelling savor. We have to learn to remain in God's will, but get out of his way. The Lord spoke that to me this morning early. I said, ooh, I'm going to write that down. He said, you have to learn to stay in my will, but get out my way. I said, Lord, that's good. And many times we think we know what's right because of how we've been trained and raised. He said, just stay in my will, but I need you to get out of my way because I'm going to do some things that's going to blow everybody's mind. I'm going to do some things that just don't seem like how it was done because God, when God is in the picture, he does the unusual things. When God is in the picture, he does extraordinary things. He can do abundantly above all we could ask or think, but he works with the power that is within us. As we stand to our feet, giving myself a time limit these days, because I could go on and on and on. When you have time to really dissect what that sheet means and the preconceived notions that we have 
he, he, this is Peter. This is the apostle Peter, the chief cornerstone. I mean, the chief apostle. And even he had some issues. So we have to say, Lord, with our stoic spiritual selves, help us to see what you see. Help us to see that the nation is coming to the nation. Help us to see and not have our prejudices. Some of us are just as prejudiced as white people. We're just not racist because we're, we, we, we're a member of the oppressed. So it's different than racism. Racism, you have to be a member of the, to be oppressed by other people. So as, 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 as prejudiced as some of us are toward people who drink, smoke, who have issues, God wants you to have compassion instead of prejudice. He wants you to show love instead of judgment. He says, don't call common what I call clean. As you come down this aisle, you may feel like you're saved and that's good. But if you, you need the baptism in Jesus' name, the Bible says to remove your sins. That's where the cleansing comes in, by the removing of sins. The name of Jesus is called over you. And the removing of sins takes place. People say, well, I've been baptized in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Why do I have to be baptized again? And you've heard it many times, but they never called the name of Jesus. Paul, from that point on, and Peter, they baptized in the name of Jesus. Or in some phrases, they say, calling upon the name of the Lord. And so the name of Jesus is what takes those sins away from you. The name of Jesus, what cleanses you? Don't you not know when you witness to somebody, you become an answer to their prayer. When you show love to somebody, you become an answered prayer. And I believe that everyone under the sound of my voice in this room, you are an answered prayer to somebody, but you don't know the purpose yet for your life. You don't quite know the will of God for your life. And so we have to seek him. Say, Lord, what is my purpose? Who am I supposed? You need to get up every morning. I say, Lord, who am I going to bless today? Who am I going to encourage today? Who am I going to bless today? Wake up. Wake up. Wake up, O Zion. Put on your strength. For the glory of the Lord is revealed. Wake up. Come off the roof, Peter. Go downstairs, Peter. Don't just sit there. They're waiting for you to answer their prayers, Peter. Come off the roof. Wake up. We are an answer to each other's prayers, and we don't even know it. There's gifts in the Bible.